And we are live back again on Thursday Ma- Legal Mailbag. I'm here, Bradley Clark, as always, with my partner, Abe Mashney at Baldani TV, Baldani Law Group, 300 West Short Street, downtown Lexington, Kentucky. And we are here today to answer your questions about criminal law in the state of Kentucky. As always, please remember to like, review, leave comments. Uh, we've got the counter right here. We're pushing hard to try to get to 1500 by the end of the year. I know it's a big ask, but if you go and like our page, Baldoni Law Group, it's really going to help us out, and we really do appreciate it. That being said, let's go to the intro. All right, and we are back. Um, now, today, as I said, we're doing another one of our legal grab bag, mail bag, whatever you want to call it. We're answering questions, providing information. Obviously, uh, any questions you ask don't necessarily make, create an attorney-client relationship, but what they do do is they give you some information. So, um, Abe, you about ready to start off, or do you want me to kind of follow up with a couple things from the last week? Sure, let's start. All right, you ready? Okay. We're going to try to keep it short today, ladies and gentlemen. It is a holiday week. So, the... First question we're going to kind of get into, I'm going to ask you, Abe. This came in, um, somebody from Lexington actually wrote this question. It's, how do I get rid of a warrant if I've got a warrant? Now, I, I think maybe start by explaining what a warrant is, and then we'll kind of go into depth about how it works in Fayette County and how it may work other places. Sound good? Sure. So a warrant is someone, either an officer, a judge, prosecutor, they believe that there is probable cause for an arrest warrant. And so a warrant is... It's an indication to all law enforcement that if you come in contact with that person, they are bound to arrest you. And so to get rid of a warrant means that the warrant has already existed. It, it is out there. The judge has signed it. And, um, and, and an individual, we get calls here and there about people wanting to get their warrant set aside and, 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 and so they don't get arrested. And the only way that to get it uh, set aside and is to go through the prosecutor. The prosecutor has to agree on the terms, and sometimes it's a situation where restitution needs to be paid, or it's a super old warrant, and uh, maybe they don't want to go forward anymore. There's several reasons to set aside a warrant, um, but in order to get it set aside, you have to first go through the prosecutor, and then secondly, the judge has to agree to set it aside. Okay, so what are some good reasons a judge might set aside a warrant? Well, I've had a few, um, and recently it's I've had a case where it's from the 1980s. Oh wow! <laughs> it uh, the warrant has been still out there, and once a warrant gets signed, it it, it doesn't go away. It, it's always going to be out there hanging around, and so if that person has any uh, any interaction with law enforcement, especially here in the state of Kentucky, they're going to arrest you, no matter how old that warrant is, and so. Um, some reason is uh, like my recent case it's it's an 80s case and uh it involved a theft well she paid the restitution and uh we're in the process of getting it set aside okay great so i guess what you're saying is a judge may set aside a warrant if you kind of it's it's a fair thing to do ultimately and it might be i missed court because my car broke down or it could be you know uh you know, I've paid the restitution. It's a really old case. I've turned myself in. Or I'm willing to, you know, bring myself to justice. You don't have to have, I'm going to save the state the time and expense of having to track me down. Those are some reasons, right? Yeah. And what you normally find is the individual is out of state. And so um, it hasn't been served yet. And they are calling us to try to get it worked out without them having to come back to the state of Kentucky, turn themselves in and, and start that process. And so I've had another recent one with an individual out of, uh, I believe, California. It was kind of an older case as well. And in that case, the victim in the matter didn't want to proceed. And so um, the prosecutor actually reached out to him, talked to the victim. They said, you know what, I'm out of state now. I don't want to proceed. And the prosecutor, and obviously we agreed to set it aside. So they went to the judge. The judge agreed, and and we got that taken care of as well. So... Is this like something that's likely to happen if I have like a murder charge or something or? Absolutely not. No, it's everything. It's, it's all different circumstances and it's a case by case basis. Yeah. So it's kind of ultimately, it's kind of about what's fair. Like that's ultimately whether or not your warrant's going to get set aside. So if it's a misdemeanor, you know, more likely than if it's a felony and if it's a low level felony, more likely than it's, you know, something violent or sex offense or something like that. Yep. 
Okay, cool. I think that's uh, anything else you want to talk about warrants right now? Nope. Okay, let's move on to talk about uh, this next question. And I, I want to take it kind of on two levels. The question that we have written here is, you know, what things should you ask yourself before you plead guilty? So I'm going to let you handle that, and then I'll kind of ask, answer questions that I think you should ask your lawyer before you plead guilty. So, Abe, what, what are the things that you think you should think about before you plead guilty? Well, first off is what do I think um, my punishment's going to be? In uh, circuit court, you never really know until the judge is, is going to hand down it at sentencing. So what I'm referring to is whether or not I'm going to potentially get probation or have to serve prison time uh, and how that affects. Um, also, if you're a hunter or if you possess firearms and you're pleading guilty to a felony, am I okay with not possessing a firearm for the rest of my life? Um, if there's any immigration consequences, then that person needs to speak with an immigration attorney to, to make sure before you plead guilty. Uh, there's a famous case called Padilla that, that makes that a requirement before yeah. any guilty pleas. So you're telling me if I have an immigration consequence, maybe I'm here on a green card or a lawful permanent resident, I, I need to have an immigration lawyer too, not just a criminal lawyer? Absolutely. We do not claim to be immigration attorneys. And so with those types well, why, of... Why, why don't you? Why not? Why don't you just go learn all that? There's not enough time in the day for me to uh, learn that, and um, it, it's just a, it's an ever-evolving uh, area of law. It changes all the time, and so I, I'm, I'm staying clear of that. Okay, continue. Sure. Um, and so there's, there's the, what the consequences are, what external uh, collateral factors, what, what those are going to be, and, um, and is, is this a case that did I do it? Uh, first and foremost, I mean, is this a case that we could potentially win? And uh, all of those are conversations that you're going to need to have with your attorney, what the strategy is. And, and, and first off, do I know everything that the Commonwealth is, is intending to prove against me? And so that's why it's really important to have a good relationship with your attorney, have open lines of communication, and uh, that way you're making informed decisions. Okay, great. You know, I think those are all things people need to consider. And you know, kind of the flip side of that is what should you ask your lawyer before you plead guilty? And, and I think it's a lot of the same things. It's how is this going to impact my job? How is this going to impact my my life? Like are, maybe you're getting student loans. Maybe you're getting uh, government subsidized housing. Maybe you have an immigration issue. You need to be thinking about asking your lawyer about those. But also, I mean, you need to ask them, what is this sentence that I'm really agreeing to? Because a lot of the times there's uncertainty, whether or not it be federal, uh, a federal crime and you're under the sentencing guidelines. A good lawyer can say, well, in my experience, I've seen this judge do this or, uh, you know, even in state court. There may be a question, is, is it probatable? Am I going to get probation? What are the odds? Uh, you know, obviously nobody in, in, a, in an open probation kind of offer can guarantee probation, but there are certain things that if you have the experience, you know, you're going to know that a Class D theft where restitution has been paid is very likely to be a probated sentence, whereas a Class B felony uh, where there was no restitution paid is likely going to send you to prison, even if, you, if you're even eligible for probation at all. And so um, I would say also knowing parole guidelines, like what percentage you have to serve is very important. You know, we're looking at uh, new good time, uh, new good time rules under the federal system with the First, uh, First Step Act. Uh, and there's a whole lot of, you know, just differences in how sentences are going to be calculated. If I am sent to prison, where will I serve my time? You know, those kinds of things. Can I get transferred? All of those are the kinds of questions that you need to be thinking about if you are charged with a crime and you do intend to plead guilty. Now, that's not to say that everyone should plead guilty, but um, the reality is a vast majority of people do. And so they need to be thinking about these things if they are charged. So um, I'm going to move on. Um, the next question we've got is about a thing called shock probation. We hear a lot about shock probation, I think, practicing. Um, you don't see it happen very often. The joke I always make is you're shocked when it happens. <laughs> um, but it is a thing, and uh, you know, I've had it happen this year. But um, Abe, do you want to kind of talk about what shock probation is and what, what increases somebody's chances of getting it? Sure. So shock probation is a concept that at sentencing, the judge has, has deemed that person that, and has sentenced them to prison, meaning that the case is over, there's a conviction, a sentencing has happened, they have denied that person the, uh, the, act, or the privilege of probation at that sentencing hearing, and the person is currently in jail or, or in prison at that time. And so for a period of 30 days, you have to wait 30 days, and up to 180 days, that person can petition the court 
kind of like ask for a second chance. Mm -hmm. And uh, the theory behind it is that that person has been shocked. The, the act of going to jail, the act of going to prison has, uh, has shocked their conscience and, uh, and that the judge needs to give them a second chance. They've served some time, they've thought about their actions, and, uh, and, and the judge wants to give them that opportunity of probation. So it's, it's kind of a last ditch effort um, in order to, to get that privilege of probation so you don't have to serve that all that time and wait for parole. Okay, yeah, no, and um, what are some of the things that you think make somebody more likely to get that second chance? Well, um, first off, you have to be probation eligible to begin with. And so if you're not probation eligible uh, on, the, on the convicted charge, well, you're not gonna be shocked probation eligible either. Um, as far as sometimes you'll judges during sentencing will allude to the possibility of shock probation. They'll say, well, I'm not going to give you it now, but I'll consider it in the future. And that's kind of a wink, wink. Um, I mean, they're not guaranteeing anything, mm -hmm. but they're at least saying that you're in the ball game. Um, as far as if any type of restitution has been paid, um, depending on what the circumstance, what type of charge they pled guilty to, what their record is, um, if there was any remorse uh, as far as their actions. And then also there's some strategical aspects of it as far as when you file that motion for shock. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. So as the law says that it's in its KRS uh, 439.2, Two six five, and that's the felony version, and then KRS 439.267, that is going to be the misdemeanor version. And so uh, you can file it on that first day. On that 30th day, you can file it. But, and, and there's, no, there's no limitation on how many times you can file the motion for shock. However, me personally, I'm of the opinion that it's kind of a one-shot deal. Now, if it, I, I mean... I've seen it to it's, where everybody's got a different story about this. It's kind of funny. Yeah. yeah. So I, I think that it's better to to put your all bags or eggs in one basket. And so it, the the strategical aspect. Thank of, you. Hey. <laughs> okay. Um, we went up one. Come on, people, like yeah. us. So what? When do you file it? Do you file it on the thirtieth day? Do you file it on the hundred eightieth day? Do you file it ten times? Uh, five times? Two times? And so those are those are just decisions that you have to discuss and, and, it, and ultimately it's cons consultation with the client their family and uh and then knowing the judge as well yeah no i think that's right i think a lot of i think different judges want it done different ways in different cases and there's no like i don't think there's a hard and fast rule i definitely have had people that have absolutely begged me to file at 30 and i filed at 30 and it's been granted i've had people that i think it hurt but they got shocked out eventually anyway i typically wait the full the judge has 60 days to consider the petition after you file it so you could file at 30, you could file at 90, you could file at 150, you could file at 60, and then 120 and 180, which is typically what I recommend. Um, that way you get kind of three bites of that apple. I know I would be interested to see what judges thought about that. Uh, maybe, you know, next time I'm on the show with Andrew Hager and Judge Privet, I could ask him. Or, you know, maybe we'll get another judge on this show. Who knows? So I think going back to that, though, it's really important whenever you file the motion to give them, give the judge a plan as to yeah. if you grant it, what happens next, whether that be rehab, school, job, uh, what are you giving them the privilege of probation to, to actually do? And what, how does it, why is it important? And yeah, so no. painting that picture and, uh, and, and maybe tugging on the heartstrings, maybe, maybe uh, saying, giving them a plan of action, saying this is where they're going to go for rehab and this is why they need it. Um, yeah, no, and, and ideally you would have done that in the first place at the motion for probation too. Absolutely. Which is another thing I run into, and I think different people have different thoughts on this, is do I submit a different plan for shock probation than I did for probation, or is it just the amount of time that lapsed? What, what, what is it really that is going to influence the judge? I mean, again, I think that just comes down to the judge and the circumstances, but we're trying to keep it short today, so let's move on. Um, that's shock probation. You should ask your lawyer about it before you plead guilty. <laughs> Uh, but let's move on. The next question is one I get a whole lot, and it's about the Miranda warnings. Sure. Um, the Miranda warnings, as we all know, are the you know thing you always hear on the cop shows. You have a right to remain silent. Anything can say can anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. You have a right to an attorney. If you cannot afford one, one will be provided for you. And what I'll get is I'll get a lot of clients that'll say, "Hey, I, you got this, man. This is an easy case. They didn't read me my Miranda rights. This is going to get thrown out." Happens a, all the time. What, yes. do, what do you say to that client? 
It depends. Um, it, it might not matter at all. It may, might make the huge make huge difference. And so, what the actual Miranda warning is for is for a coerced confession. And, and so, the individual, the defendant, has to know that they have a right to remain silent, or has has to know that they have a right to an attorney. And so it only matters in, in the context of whether or not that individual, that defendant, is making incriminating statements to law enforcement. Because, the statement is what gets suppressed, not, yes. not the case. So if I'm carrying a bunch of drugs or if I'm carrying contraband or, or anything like that, just because I'm carrying that or possessing that, mm -hmm. uh, that doesn't get thrown out just because... Uh, I, I wasn't given my Miranda warning or if I punched a person and it's on it's on video or or anything like that And so the only thing that Miranda applies to is the statement itself Nothing else. So if the whole case is based on the statement though the case could get thrown out. Absolutely Yeah, but if the statement is just additional evidence or what often it is is people like lying or saying things that aren't even relevant. Um, it may not have anything, any outcome on any outcome determinative effect, any real effect on the case. Right. Yep. So um, that's another thing to ask your lawyer about: is you know, are, is my statement admissible? Obviously, uh, for Miranda to apply, it doesn't apply in every circumstance. If you get pulled over for DUI, they don't have to immediately read you your rights. It's not like, you know, and it's also it has to be a statement. So. You know, you performing badly on the one-legged stand isn't a statement. It's just a demonstration of your physical condition. So that doesn't mean that that gets thrown out. Um, there's actually been cases that have gone so far as to say that reading the alphabet, you know, doing a, the ABC test or whatever, that's not a statement, which is interesting. But um, I would say that the, the courts are going to look at it and, and to see if it even applies, you have to be in custody, meaning yeah. that... It, it's easy if you're if you're handcuffed, or it's sure. easy if you're in the detective de de detention center. Or yes, or. yeah, that that, that means that's that's an easy, clear cut. You are uh, in custody. However, where it becomes a gray line is whether or not you're constructively detained, or, mm -hmm. or constructively do you fit, do you subjectively feel that you cannot go anywhere. Now, law enforcement, they're going to say, no. He, of course I, he could go. I, I didn't tell him to He's stay. free to go. Yeah. Right. I, I had a guy the other day, or not the other day, a couple months ago. He pulled my got my client over for a traffic violation. And the question was, did he detain him too long? Eventually, he did a search of the vehicle. We're not going to get into that. But he wrote the traffic ticket for speeding. And he went back. And he was about to hand it to my guy. And then he continued to ask him questions. And the whole question, the, the whole thing I had was, you know, was he free to go at that point? Could he have left? Oh, yeah, he could have driven off. I'm like, well, the ticket was still in your hand. And he's like, well, yeah, he could have, he could have asked for the ticket, and then I would have let him go. And the judge just cut him off, and it was like, come on, really? Right. Like, he was not, I mean, say what you will, but he wasn't free to go. And it's just, you know, there's a lot of talk by defense attorneys about test -a lying and how, you know, officers can say untrue things on the stand. It does happen. I mean, that was, I don't know that I consider that lying so much as I consider it shading or, you know, argument. Mm -hmm. But that's not what you're supposed to do when you're on the stand. And that we ultimately won that hearing. That search got thrown out. Be, in part, I think, because that officer was not playing by the rules. I mean, they had better legal arguments they could have made. He made the prosecutor's job harder, and he didn't have to do that. And because of it, I, you know, the person who's presumed innocent walked free. So there you go. Um, well, let's move on um, up to what goes on your record. This is a question you came up with, Abe, and I think I'm probably best yeah. to answer it. So when we talk about record, we're talking about two things. There's an arrest record, and then there's a record of convictions. And the FBI um, keeps a record of everyone that's ever been fingerprinted and arrested. And that is reported through what's called NCIC, or CGIS, uh, Criminal Justice Information Services, National Criminal Inventory, whatever, I, something like that. They're two different uh, databases. But the point is, if you're just merely arrested, that information is going to go into one database. And that information is not available to everyone. Um, and then secondly, there's going to be what are called court records. And those are going to be records of where the case was created, the citation, your bond papers, anything like that related to the case, motions that were filed, the disposition of the case, meaning like the judgment, um, you know, guilty, not guilty, whatever. Those are a separate kind of record. Now, to answer this, what goes on your record is everything. Every time you're arrested, every time there's a court case. A lot of people will tell me, well, I got a speeding ticket, but it's over three years, it's off my record. It's not. It's not counted against your driver's license points anymore, but it still shows up on your criminal background. Uh, and then other people will tell me, well, I was acquitted and it was expunged. Well, you may still be able to find that arrest record depending upon when the expungement was done, what agencies had the records, those kinds of things. So the best thing to assume is that everything goes on your record forever until it's removed. And so if you have something on your record that's older, 
and you've stayed out of trouble, you really should look into uh, expungement processes or uh, segregation of records processes, sealing, voiding, those kinds of things. Because these things do follow you around. Um, under Kentucky state law, we're not supposed to report in background checks anything that was re resulted in a dismissal or a not guilty. Uh, there's still a lot of that out there. A lot of employers just run illegal background checks um, just themselves on Google, where they just Google you and your mugshots, and so those mugshot websites come up. But um, ultimately, that's not supposed to happen, and Kentucky, you're supposed to be looking at it. Yeah, you can look at convictions forever, though. And so under federal law, you can look at non-convictions for up to seven years under the Fair Credit Reporting Act. But um, ultimately, if you've got something on your record, um, you need to talk to a defense attorney about potentially getting it removed. It can make a big difference in your life. So um, does that answer your question, Abe? Absolutely. All right, we've got one more. Let me make sure we don't have any in the comments. doesn't appear that we do. Remember, you guys can ask questions. We'll answer them. And you can also go and you can like us on our Facebook group page. But uh, in any event, we've got one last question we're going to answer, and I'm going to let you do this one, Abe. It's the so-called 60-day rule on indictments. Um, and that's in state court in Kentucky. Could you go tell, tell us a little bit about what that is? Sure. Let me set the stage. So um, a person is charged with a felony and they have completed the district court portion of their case, meaning that they have been arraigned, they have gone to their preliminary hearing, and the case has been held to a grand jury, meaning that a judge either uh, has found probable cause for the case to continue or that individual has waived that case to the grand jury. So from the date of the prelim, they have the, the Commonwealth has 60 days in order to indict that individual. And if they don't indict that individual within that 60 days and that person is in jail, then their attorney can file a motion or what I've found to be the easiest way is to get an agreed order with myself, the prosecutor, and then walk it down to the judge's office for the judge to sign. That person can be released. It doesn't mean that the case is going to be dismissed. It doesn't mean that they can't go forward. It just means that as a, as a matter of public policy, we're not going to keep people in jail past 60 days if the Commonwealth hasn't presented their case and, and secured that indictment. Okay. Well, that about sums it up for today. I said we we're going to keep it short. Um, as always, we do Thursday. We do legal mailbag. If you've got questions, leave them in the comments. We'll get to them eventually. We've got a really good one Mario Martinez gave us last week that we may do a whole segment on. Uh, as always, stay out of trouble. Um, but if you do get in trouble, give us a call. Abe, you got anything else to add? Happy holidays. I hope everybody had a great Christmas. and um, Don't drink and drive. Yeah, be responsible and celebrate the New Year's uh, safely. Uh, Happy New Year.